Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this webinar this morning. I know there's a lot going on and a lot of no news, and so appreciate having you guys tune in to hear this presentation on policy, policy and regulatory needs of um, technology providers in the Clean Energy Ag Nexus. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. I want to remind you that this session is going to be recorded and we'll be sharing that recording on Friday. There's a Q&A box on the right hand side. Please feel free to submit your questions there and comments throughout the session and we'll have a Q&A session at the end where we'll, where we'll try to answer those some, some of those questions. You have the option of submitting your question anonymously or if you include your name, that's also great for us to get to know you and have more of a dialogue. Um, the session will be in English, although there's also simultaneous transcription in Arabic, French, German, Spanish, and Swahili. You can access this through the closed caption software um, that's built into the platform. To turn these on, you should select captions and subtitles and use the closed caption option to icon in your video controls to change the caption language, select settings icon, and then the caption slash subtitles to choose your preferred language. That's a lot coming at you quickly, so we'll ch chat those instructions to you as well in case you are interested in that option. Um, with that, let's go ahead to the first slide. So briefly, the agenda today, um, we'll, we will be focusing primarily on a presentation of a roundtable, a policy roundtable that we conducted under Paring Agriculture. And then we'll have a brief introduction of the Water and Energy for Food program for those of you who haven't heard that introduction in the past. And we'll have a, close, a question and answer session before closing. Next slide, please. So I will be moderating the session. My name is Augusta Abrahams. I'm the program manager for Powering Agriculture. Um, and Ari Montaforte from Tetra Tech will be presenting on the results of the round table and I'll let her introduce herself in more detail when she, when she starts presenting. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. So I wanted to start out just giving a very brief background for this work and, and how this emerged. So powering agriculture, which is, is a grand challenge that has been under implementation for over six years. The goal was to support the creation of innovations that can provide access to reliable, affordable and clean energy to farmers and agribusiness businesses in developing countries. We worked in multiple areas, including technology and business model innovation, access to finance and investment, mainstreaming and scaling, and knowledge management. Um, as we worked with, but the bulk of our work was really with grantees who were piloting new technologies and trying to commercialize them. As we saw some of their challenges that they were facing and the work that they were doing, we saw that policy and regulatory environment was an issue that was impacting their work. And although we didn't do a lot of direct interventions in this regard, we thought in the closing year of powering agriculture, it would be important to understand more what, how, in a more systematic way, how uh, innovators were experiencing challenges and, um, and provide some insights about what could be done and how to support them in the policy and regulatory space. So um, next slide, please. With that brief background, let me go ahead and turn it over to Ari, who can talk more about the policy roundtable that we led and the insights that we've gained from this process. Thank you, Augusta. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. My name is Arai Monteforte and I am an energy sector director at Tetra Tech and one of the authors of this guide navigating policy and regulation in the clean energy agriculture nexus along with Augusta at USAID and also various other other colleagues. Uh, so before we go into the presentation I would like to review the agenda. Uh, first, I will give an overview on the motivation behind the policy roundtable activity that produced this guide and Augusta gave a brief introduction. 
Uh, next, an overview of the process we followed to collect and analyze data, which involved interviews and in-person policy roundtable in Kenya. Um, third, uh, the key policy and regulatory barriers that we collected from innovators, examples of the challenges that these barriers introduced, and insights on successful ways these barriers have been addressed. And last, just some key takeaways from, from this work. So uh, Powering Agriculture observed that um, innovators met several policy and regulatory uh, barriers that hindered scaling up operations, securing partnerships, and expanding to new countries. And this impacted them in meeting their, their grant milestones. Uh, some examples included uh, holdups of shipping containers, of products at borders due to unclear custom rules, difficulty in extending loans to consumers, uh, difficulty in expanding operations into new countries that had certain protectionist rules in place. Um, and Powering Act noticed that uh, there were few fora for innovators to one, voice their concerns, um, and also to engage with policymakers and other government bodies. So based on this, the idea of a policy roundtable came about to convene clean energy agriculture stakeholders to document these pain points and identify potential solutions. And this was specifically focused on three technologies, uh, solar water pumping, cold storage and agro-processing, and is all summarized in, in this guide. To, to collect data, we, we first conducted uh, 32 interviews of innovators, nonprofits, donors, and other stakeholders working in the clean energy agriculture nexus in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and Latin America. And these took place in the spring and summer of 2019. So some of these facts may be outdated as the situation on the ground is often dynamic, uh, yet many of the issues are, are still broadly experienced. Innovators covered many topics in the interviews, including government policies and regulations, subsidies, customs and tariffs, product quality standards and industry associations. And this set the scene uh, for a round table event. So in September 2019, we held a roundtable event in Nairobi, Kenya, that convened more than 30 innovators, uh, government of Kenya representatives, regional renewable energy associations, national associations from Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya and other stakeholders to validate the interview findings and, and identify ways forward. And this involved plenary sessions with the audience and, and small breakout groups. So based on the data we collected and validated during the interviews and the roundtable event, we identified four key policy and regulation categories, uh, promoting ease of business operations, stimulating market growth, recognizing and rewarding quality and strengthening private sector government partnerships. These priorities became the focus of the guide. And then for each category, we documented relevant barriers that innovators experience and expressed in each priority area, specific examples of these barriers, recommendations for policymakers to address these barriers, and then insights on successful actions that have been taken to address these barriers. And I will now summarize um, these points for each of the priority areas. So the first priority that we identified was promoting ease of business operations. Innovators highlighted three primary barriers. Innovators found that their imported product uh, components often received inconsistent applications of customs and tariffs. And such problems with paperwork caused delays and storage fees at ports. 
Uh, for example, a solar water pumping innovator in Tanzania noted that since their product straddles both the clean energy and agriculture product categories, the applicable custom regime was not very clear. Um, in another example, an agro-processing um, innovator in Kenya noted that although uh, solar PV is exempt from uh, value added tax or VAT, if a consignment included batteries or other components, everything would be taxed altogether. Innovators also noted limited access to hard currency and foreign investment. Um, a key concern for many companies is the ability to access hard currency to buy product stock and other services from abroad and then repatriate it uh, to repay international investors. Uh, and central bank regulations and lengthy procedures can dramatically affect business operations. So for example, a cold storage innovator in Nigeria noted that transferring and exchanging money from foreign currency into local currency can be a lengthy process and hinders company growth. On, on barriers to lending, um, governments regulate lending to support liquid markets and protect consumers from predatory practices. However, uh, government policies can sometimes limit the flow or increase the cost of capital to companies that seek to provide innovative financing options to traditionally underserved markets. Uh, so, for example, innovators mentioned that in 2016, Kenya introduced a 14.5% cap and 7.35% deposit floor on commercial lending interest rates to reduce the cost of borrowing. However, it unintentionally restricted credit access for micro and small and medium enterprises, particularly in trade and agriculture. Another example is Tanzania's Microfinance Act. Uh, it treats companies that offer small scale financing like solar water pumping companies a formal micro, uh, as formal microfinance institutions, introducing many licensing requirements and difficulties. And, and this hurts some of our, uh, of our innovators. So based on these barriers, we documented asks with consensus between government officials and innovators on inconsistent application of uh, custom tariffs. Both innovators um, and government officials agreed that it was necessary to work with customs and revenue authorities to develop transparent tools and informational resources on products defined as clean energy agriculture products and to train custom and border agents to apply correct tariffs at borders. In terms of currency and foreign investment, the ask was to streamline policies and, regulator, uh, and, and regulations uh, related to access to foreign currency and the Forex's caps or highly regulated may clean energy ag exempt. On barriers to lending, uh, the ask was to review national regulations that constrain lending or limit pay as you go, um, which can help innovators increase access to financing for their consumers. The, the policy paper also gathers a few insights or examples of programs, innovations or interventions that government have put uh, governments have put in place to address these barriers. So for example, Kenya's one window import framework includes harmonized system HS codes uh, for solar water pumps and refrigerators, which provide definition for clean energy agriculture products. And regarding the rate cap that I spoke uh, about earlier, uh, Kenya removed it uh, and top banking executives cited declining access to credit as a motivation uh, for this decision. The, the second priority that we covered was stimulating market growth, under which there were four primary barriers. First, 
innovators noted uh, high custom uh, customs and tariff duties. Uh, many clean energy agriculture products cost several hundred dollars, placing them out of reach for rural smallholder farmers. Uh, for example, research recently published by CLASP uh, quantified the import duties and, and VAT in particular uh, account for over 30% of total system costs for off-grid refrigerators. On smart subsidies to lower end user costs, a few innovators noted that they have not been able to achieve a price point that makes their products truly accessible to the smallholder farmers markets that they seek to serve. Uh, and they noted the lack of smart, well-designed subsidies as a barrier. Um, innovators noted that abrupt removal of subsidy uh, of subsidies uh, may cause a price jump that negatively impacts willingness to pay and therefore highlighted the need of a clear exit strategy. Uh, market awareness of clean energy agriculture was another barrier. In nascent markets, the private sector is often forced to educate farmers about the benefits of mechanization, clean energy technologies, mobile banking, uh, and, and these can uh, place burdens on, on these innovators. Uh, so governments can more credibly and effectively deliver such market information um, as a public good for farmers. On access to finance for companies and end users, uh, companies noted difficulties in securing financing for themselves and for end users. They often borrow or buy equipment in foreign currency and are paid in local currency, resulting in foreign exchange risk. They also often lack working capital to scale up technology deployment. Um, and a little parenthesis here, Powering ag Agriculture also produced a paper based on innovator insights titled Access to Financing for Early Stage Innovators in the Clean Energy Agriculture Nexus. And this details the barriers and necessary support for innovators in accessing private capital and follow on funding and is available on the Powering Agriculture website. So what were some recommendations brought forward uh, in, in this category? Uh, for duty and tariff exemptions, the ask was to put in place reductions and exemptions on import duties, tariffs, and VAT for clean energy agriculture products. For subsidies that directly affect end user costs, the ask was to design private sector friendly smart subsidy programs that are time bound with exit strategies and tailored to consumer needs. Uh, Results-based financing was mentioned by many as a viable option. For market awareness, innovators asked both governments and donors to fund market awareness programs, including technology demonstrations, trainings, extension work, and other outreach. And to increase access to finance for companies and end users, the ask was to establish local currency facilities and support microfinance institutions and in giving loans to end users, including uh, by de-risking investments such as through loan guarantees. So a, a few government actions that have been put in place to address these barriers. Um, for example, in Kenya, VAT is removed for all solar PV products and the Kenya Renewable Energy Association, Korea, helped advocate for this. Also earlier this year, not documented in, in, the, in the guide, uh, Senegal introduced a VAT exemption for all off-grid solar PV products. Um, and what was interesting is that it covers solar water pumps, but coal storage and agro-processing is covered under agricultural sector exemptions, which is consistent with some of the concerns flagged uh, by some of our innovators. Another example in this market growth category is Kenya Equity Bank's program Ecomoto, 
Um, it's a loan facility supported by IFC that enables consumers to directly apply for loans for solar lanterns, solar home systems, and improved cook stoves under mobile phones. And while this facility uh, focus is not clean energy ag, we thought to mention it as an example of consumer financing that could be applied to, to these products. The third priority was recognizing and rewarding quality. Uh, this one had a mixed bag uh, of the need of consumers to understand how to differentiate high quality products from low quality ones, but also the concern that prematurely placed standards can add financial burdens and restrict product innovation. So innovators place more interest in labeling for consumer awareness to educate them on how to assess performance and quality versus cost. So on the recognition of products for differentiation, innovators noted that customers often don't have access um, uh, to uh, information on Clean Energy Act technologies and particularly on how to differentiate high quality ones. Um, and so this lack of product quality differentiation can hinder product uptake by consumers. On quality and safety standards, innovators recognize that um, energy efficiency, safety, performance are important in protecting consumers and in differentiating products. However, development of these um, should be done cautiously and not place burdens on innovators. On labeling of products for consumer awareness, innovators highlighted that there is limited information on products uh, specifications and that clear, understandable labeling on product adds to the case for differentiation of high quality products and uh, for educating consumers. So a few recommendations transpired transpire from the data collected. Um, on recognition for, uh, of products for differentiation, um, it was to support award programs that recognize high quality products, which produce much needed market intelligence for consumers. Uh, for example, the Global Leap Awards managed by CLASP include data-driven lab and, and very importantly, field testing of productive use appliances to then give awards to quality uh, to high quality products. On quality and safety standards, uh, there was a consensus to begin with lab and field testing for voluntary quality standards, and only as the market matures to develop mandatory performance standards. On labeling of products, um, innovators wanted to make sure that the private sector was consulted on the development of product labeling roadmaps and to ensure that it was not prohibitively expensive for innovators to attend these uh, to attain these uh, labeling commitments as the market develops. So in terms of insights, I've, I've covered the, the LEAP award. Um, an interesting example is the use of, of import standardization uh, marks or ISMs. Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, India, among other countries, use them to verify that a product meets certain national standards. In Kenya, for example, ISMs have a QR code that consumers can use to scan and quickly learn more um, about products. The fourth and final category we identified was strengthening private sector government partnerships. Several innovators noted the need to better communicate the value of the services they provide to farmers and governments. However, they did not feel um, they were best placed both in terms of resources and credibility to articulate the benefits of clean technologies with respect to traditional ones. They felt governments and donors are better placed than innovators to fund such efforts which can include um, creating studies, uh, thought leadership pieces, and other analysis. 
uh, leaving the task to innovators to differentiate and sell their own products. There is also often a disconnect between all the government agencies that relate to the clean energy agriculture nexus. Innovators noted that a solar a water pump can be supported by government bodies that work in energy and water and livestock and irrigation, uh, and that policies and programs are often developed by one agency, but should get input from, from many others. In terms of private sector engagement in policy making, innovators explained that they, they want a voice in policy uh, making, and several noted that they collaborate with national renewable energy advocacy and trade organizations. Um, however, renewable energy associations are not always representative of the clean energy ag uh, sector, since these companies are often small and less commercial than other members. Uh, and so innovators noted that early stage companies are already stretched thin in resources and capital. Uh, many uh, do not have the experience or resources or time to engage in policy ideation um, and development. So what are some of the asks and recommendations that came through? On supporting raising awareness of clean energy agriculture value proposition, and this directed to both governments and donors, the ask was to produce data-driven research on costs and benefits for policymakers' use. Uh, for example, the Powering Ag website hosts a number of resources such as reports uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization that outline the costs and benefits of large government interventions for solar water pumps and cold storage uh, and biodigesters. Um, another ask is to form effective intra-governmental working groups and engage industry associations. And finally, to include uh, credible trade associations and policy making that uh, can represent a broader spectrum of interest and aggregate their, their needs. And regarding the Clean Energy Ag Nexus, support the development of focus working groups within industry associations that are better placed to advocate on more specific topics relevant to the Clean Energy Ag Nexus. So one example of addressing this topic is the Gogla Community of Champions, which is an open exchange between governments on energy access topics in Africa. Uh, it holds frequent webinars and in-person learning events. Uh, and Powering Agriculture participated in a Community of Champions webinar hosted by Gogla that covered the recommendations uh, from this guide. Uh, and the main audience were policymakers from West and East Africa. So in summary, uh, we reached uh, a few primary conclusions from this activity. First, uh, innovators are developing unique uh, technologies and business models that have immense potential to transform the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. Again, here we focused on solar water pumps and clean energy powered cold storage and agro-processing. Uh, the clean energy agriculture nexus is a nascent sector that straddles multiple sectors, food, water, energy, and often lacks clarity and definition in policy and regulatory frameworks. Uh, both governments and donors have roles to play when it comes to enabling environments for clean energy agriculture, as noted by recommendations we documented. And uh, a full list of innovator priorities and their examples solutions and related insights are included in our guide, uh, which is on the Powering Agriculture website. Um, we hope that this guide can help 
empower uh, clean energy ag companies in their engagement of government stakeholders. Uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ari, for these very insightful insights. Um, I'm now going to go quickly and introduce the new project Water Energy for Food. Um, I'm going to just quickly share my screen. Give me one second. Wonderful. So Water and Energy for Food is a new uh, international initiative. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I would like to focus on explaining how we use the lessons learned from powering agriculture and incorporated them into our program design to make sure we find a way to um, at least uh, decrease the barriers that innovators are facing in the field of policy and regulatory um, needs. So just quickly, but you are more than welcome to look at our website, weforfood.org, we, W-E-4 as a number, F.org, and we'll also post in the Q&A again. Um, subscribe to our newsletter, um, for more information on the new international initiative. So Water Energy for Food is a joint international initiative um, of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Netherlands, Sweden and the US. We for Food is the successor international initiative coming from powering agriculture on the one hand and securing water for food on the other hand. So we also uh, support innovators in ensuring that they grow their business, um, which is focused on the water, energy and food nexus, um, and try to um, support smaller farmers, especially particularly um, in making their food product, increasing their food production while also using less inputs. Um, so what are the core areas of intervention when it comes to water and energy for food? Um, we support small, small and medium sized businesses with direct grants. Um, we support the private sector with PPPs, so called public private partnerships. Um, we offer technical assistance and financial assistance to small businesses, innovators. Um, and we also offer capacity development, meaning trainings to both end users as well as innovators as well as other organizations around the nexus topic of water energy and food lastly in order to make sure that there is an enabling environment for innovators where they can grow their product grow as a business and uh, finally uh, increase food security in a sustainable way we also work in advocacy um, for the Nexus topics, and we also generate and disseminate knowledge in, for example, the form of studies and reports. So what does We for Food want to achieve? We for Food wants to achieve to uh, increase food production as well as increase income for the poorest of the poorest, that means the base of the pyramid, um, particularly for women, but also for men in both rural and urban areas. We would like to sustainably scale the innovative solutions uh, in order to offer more solutions, innovative solutions within the nexus topic of water, energy and food, and thereby finally promote climate environmental resilience as well as biodiversity. So that was in a nutshell what the new international initi initiative and um, water and energy for food does again for more information please visit our website subscribe to our newsletter um, since we will soon start having the four first calls for funding um, we have been around for since the beginning of the year so activities are really um, are really um, coming up now um, there will be calls for innovations um, so make sure to follow us so let's see now how we actually incorporated these lessons learned um, that RAE has told us about, has just explained to us into our program design. So in order to make sure that the barriers um, are decreasing for innovators and we make the lives of the innovators a little bit easier, um, we made sure to have 
um, goals, targets, uh, and we even developed some indicators around the topic of enabling environment, which means like policy, regulations, but also financial access. Um, of course, we incorporate more than these lessons learned into our program design. There were many, many lessons learned from powering agriculture and securing water for food. But I will now concentrate on the learnings um, around the topic of policy and regulatory needs of innovators. So we made sure in our program design to include impulses from the global policy level as well as to generate learnings and knowledge for the global policy level as well so basically make sure make sure that we as a program as an international initiative take part in the global discourse around the, the water energy for food nexus and the policy debates um, on the global level then we also made sure to have activities to facilitate advocacy for an enabling environment for innovators in the regions and include the creation of policy reports, which means basically making sure that innovators in their regions, in their countries, find ways to grow their product. Um, so basically not just ignoring that issue, but like making sure um, that we have activities in the field of enabling environment. And then lastly, um, also engaging in global and regional policy networks and debates, uh, including the creation of working groups, study trips and inputs to policy making processes, which goes back to what RIE has just explained to us, making sure there is a platform for innovators to engage with policymakers as well as policymakers engaging with, with each other from different regions, different countries, um, that there is like a debate and the policymakers understand what the innovators need and the innovators understand what the policymakers want from them and what the government, what are the needs, what are the barriers, what are the opportunities within the government space. So very quickly on a higher level, this was what we do as We for Food, how we incorporated the lessons learned from powering agriculture into We for Food. Um, and with that, I think we are moving forward to the Q&A with Augusta and RIE. Thank you, Jana. Can you hear me now? OK, yes, we can. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for that update on water and energy for food. So we have just a few questions coming in and folks are once again welcome to chat additional questions in the chat box. Ari, the first question is how were policymakers engaged in the policy roundtable interviews and roundtable process? Uh, let me make sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, they were less involved in the interview pieces, but more during the roundtable uh, where we actually invited um, representatives from the Kenya Ministry of Energy, uh, from the Bureau of Standards uh, and Revenue Authority to really engage with the innovators uh, that, that joined the roundtable. Um, and what was interesting is that the feedback at the end of the round table was extremely positive um, because the innovators noted that uh, they, they didn't get a lot of those chances to interact directly with uh, government authorities and so that this was a, a unique opportunity. Great, and just out of curiosity, how did you think uh, the policymakers themselves responded to? Being involved. I think that, that that was also very positive uh, it, it, from the side of the policymakers. They also don't get a lot of chances of interacting directly and hearing these concerns. The, the, the roundtable was very participatory and very mixed, so they got to hear a range of, of inputs. And they were also very, very candid in, in their uh, opinions on how to support the sector. So moving on to the next question, we have um, we have a question about what your thoughts about the really the most interesting finding from the roundtable activity, what, what those were. 
so one one is uh, what was just mentioned is this this idea that uh, their voice is a bit more squashed within the renewable energy uh, sector, and so because they are less represented, because their companies are less mature, uh, smaller in in sales and and, and influence, um, they have less opportunities uh, and and resources to engage, uh, and so that ability to have their issues articulated uh, and uh, and these asks aggregated uh, was a, a, an opportunity that they, they highlighted a lot. OK, that is that is interesting. I know that we've often found in in powering agriculture that working in the nexus um, in an, in a nexus of two sectors means that you don't have a natural home Whereas, whereas um, mini grid developers might have an organization like AMDA or Off Grid Solar, Gogla or the like that for these productive use technologies that straddle two, um, two sectors. And I think the same is going to be true in the water and ag space that there's not necessarily a advocate. And so maybe it's a harder to find a forum. And so I think that's that that's interesting. Um, it was something that I noticed as well. Um, so another question we have is, um, how can we make sure that product quality standards aren't set prematurely and hinder product innovation? And and this was this was actually one of one of the concerns, right? Uh, again, this dichotomy of of wanting product differentiation, wanting to show that their product was uh, a higher quality than others, but also uh, a, a scared of of what a, a mandatory standard can do. And we have a lot of examples in the energy efficiency sector of uh, of what. Um, voluntary standards can do and, and part of this is to help set first what is the metric what are the indicators how can that be measured how can quality and performance be measured and then have those uh, companies that are at the front of the market start meeting those and showing the rest the, the, the way um, so for example uh, an agro-processing innovator in particular noted that this could be a useful way uh, especially since there's no standards on solar powered agro processing equipment. Um, and so just even setting these voluntary standards would allow it to already think what are these metrics and how to meet them. And then as the market matures to to move into the, the more mandatory ones. OK, so it looks like we have one more final question and people are still welcome to chat additional questions here in the chat box. But I think this is building off of the, the section in your presentation where you talked about innovators being interested in subsidies, but also wary how, about how those subsidies might actually impact their business, um, that, that subsidies can be done well or done poorly. And so uh, the question is, what do you mean by smart subsidies and what did innovators have to say about favorable subsidy design? Yeah, and um, we often talk of smart subsidies as subsidies that do not distort markets, right? And and this is a little bit with tongue in cheek because subsidies do distort markets, but uh, that when they do it, that they do it, it with uh, data driven uh, decisions with uh, time bound uh, uh, and transparent exit strategies. Um, you know, one of these examples of results based financing, part of the of of the benefits of such uh, subsidies is that they have to be well designed and well thought out in terms of what are the goals that are going to be met by these subsidies, what kind of sectors are going to be covered what uh, specific targets need to be met. And so that rigorous process of setting uh, of, of setting and designing uh, uh, subsidies allow uh, for better results and also the the required measurements after the subsidies to really get give, give feedback into what has actually happened post uh, putting the, the subsidies in place. 
Thanks for that. So we have one more question in, and this is related to, um, I think, the proliferation of Chinese products in the agricultural field, for instance, in Kenya. Um, and and also had the question references the a debt trap that's associated with this. And, I, and the question wonders if there's any insights regarding that from the policy roundtable. And, and this goes back to to the the labeling and information and uh, and the ability of uh, both donors and governments to communicate to the consumer how to differentiate products, how to understand quality versus cost, because ultimately if if the consumer has that information in front of them, they can make those decisions. They could choose to purchase a cheaper Chinese product that lasts less time, but as long as that information is in front of them, then the consumer has the power to make that decision. Okay, well, thank you, Ari. I think that those are all our questions. We're, we're running just a little bit of ahead of time, but that's no problem. Um, this, is, this will be our record for <laughs> for a webinar everybody gets 10 minutes of their day back i just wanted to thank everybody again for tuning in and listening to this presentation refer you as well to the paper that was chatted to you now and is also posted on the web pages of what of powering agriculture and water and energy for food and remind you that the this recording will also be posted on the water and energy for food website Thank you again for joining and enjoy the rest of your morning or afternoon or evening, whatever it is where you are. <laughs>